With Palm Sunday comes the week that Christians cherish as no other. We name it holy. With Palm Sunday comes the high solemn feast of God's dark glory and grandeur. This is the most awesome and terrifying time of the church year. With Palm Sunday, we Christians take up a peculiar kind of waiting, and we are accustomed to waiting. Indeed, Advent creates in us an expectation, pregnant with life and possibility. During Advent, we wait in transparent joy, even as we grieve over our scarred and battered world, our broken human condition, the bright glory of the advent of our God enfolds us and our world in grace so that we might live and act in hope. But the waiting that begins with Palm Sunday is not the waiting of Advent. It is a peculiar and fearful kind of waiting, a kind of anxiety. In his passion, in allowing himself to be handled and seized, beaten and mocked and spit upon, Jesus of Nazareth discloses for us a distinctive quality of our God. And this quality disturbs us. Jesus shows us the vulnerability of God, the willingness of God to suffer for us and to suffer with us. And even as we know the end of his story, the image of a suffering God disturbs and unsettles us. We have little difficulty with the child Jesus. After all, we all were children, and many of us are parents or godparents or guardians of children. We learn not to be dismayed by crying. We accept the 2 a.m. feeding and we memorize the quickest driving routes to various playing fields. Our children are miracles full of so much wonder and possibility. But the image of the suffering, the passion of Jesus disturbs us. Prior to the Second Vatican Council, Roman Catholic artistic representation of the cross was often so graphic as to be repulsive. But since the Council, we have beautified and perhaps even sanitized the cross. For some time now, I have thought the old depictions preferable. For more than 200 years, Christians were mocked and jeered by their colleagues, friends, and relatives because they worshiped a God who had been crucified. In the ancient world, crucifixion was the most scandalous and ignominious way to die. How, their friends and family wondered, could such sane and reasonable people worship such a God, a God who allowed himself to be crucified? This image, then, a crucified, dying God, unsettles us and disturbs us. A suffering God, a God who in free initiative gives the divine self over to suffering and crucifixion, a God who allows the divine self to be spit upon and tortured unsettles us. This brings us to anguish. For if our God so suffers, is so exposed to the brutality and power of this world, what shall become of us? It is a daring and daunting theological prospect for God and for us. For if we believe that our God suffers, we who confess and worship and love that God are also called to share in the suffering of Jesus, to share in the sufferings of the people of the world. We are called to live in the trajectory, though, of expectation, released at Advent, but signified in the resurrection, and soon to be realized in the eschatological banquet.